Welcome to Thursday Bible Study. Uh, you're here again tonight with Pastor JP and Pastor Jillian, and we are excited to be able to share with you some more for Samuel. Um, we are in chapter 29. We're actually going to do two chapters today, 29 and 30. And um, I would love to begin with a word of prayer, yes, and just invite God's presence. Pastor Jillian, do you mind praying for us? Lord God, in tonight's passage, we have David facing a big challenge, and some of us face big challenges in our lives. I pray that you will give us the wisdom and the faith to let you direct how we manage them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so let's begin with chapter 29, verse 1 of 1 Samuel. Then the Philistine, oh, I should give a little bit of a, a background of yeah, where yeah. we are. So right now, David is hiding among the, um, yes, my brain is going blank, Achish and the Philistines. He's, Philistines, uh, yeah, he's yeah. among the Philistines, and uh, Saul has gone to see a medium, and the medium has uh, terrified him and caused him, and told him he's going to die, which makes him think that they're going to lose, which gives him no hope, which mm -hmm. uh, his leadership is not uh, is not on the rise. <laughs> it's on the downfall. He's listened to this evil voice that mm -hmm. has told him he's a failure, he's not going to make it, and that God has left him, mm -hmm. which makes him not seek the Lord, makes him not you know, go after God. And we return to David again after the Saul interlude because all of this is coming to a head. There's mm -hmm. a war that is happening here. And we're going to see the war from David's side before mm -hmm. we catch the war from Saul's side. So chapter 29, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek and the Israelites encamped by a fountain, which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. Then the princes of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? Okay, so think about how strange this is, right? You're, you're, it's roll call, you know, you've got the different groups and kings marching by, and leaders mm -hmm. of cities and thousands. And then at the back of the line, Mm -hmm. is David and his <laughs> small army of four, 600, I don't know, I think 600, it's 600, 600 fighting yeah, men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David and his 600 fighting men walking along with Achish. Mm -hmm. And these leaders, they have no idea what's going on. Um, it would catch me by, by surprise if I was in their shoes. And Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who's been with me these days and the, or these years? And to this day, I have found no fault in him since he defected to me. So he basically tells them the story. Hey, David came and defected to me. Mm -hmm. He's been a great Philistine. Mm -hmm. He's been awesome for our people. He's uh, been raiding uh, Israel this whole time, which he hasn't been. <laughs> um, you know, bringing back spoils of war to me mm -hmm. constantly. I mean, this has been a great deal. Uh, so I'm bringing him so that he can fight with us mm -hmm. against Israel. Verse 4, wisely, I'll have to say, but the princes of the Philistines were angry with him. So the princes of the Philistines said to him, make this fellow return. Let him go back to the place that you've appointed for him. Do not let him go down with us to battle, lest in battle he become our adversary. For what, would, for what could he reconcile himself to his master if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David of whom they sang to one another in dances, saying Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? So they're being very uh, logical here. Yeah. Uh, they, these are critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, okay, so David, David and Saul are not on the same page. But how could David get on Saul's good side mm -hmm. if he attacked from behind? Yeah, and made it a two-front war. Made it no a two-front battle. Um, and then what would Saul would be thrilled? David, come back here, mm -hmm. my son. You know, you, you saved us from utter defeat. They don't even want to risk it. They just mm -hmm. don't want David nearby. They're feeling like they can win the war without him, which, by the way, is, is absolutely correct. Uh, mm -hmm. They are going to win this battle yeah. without him. And so um, they tell Akish, just send him back to wherever you gave him to stay. Send, send him, him back to Ziklag. Have him stay in the city uh, there, uh, his town, and, mm -hmm. and be done with it. Verse 6. Akish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives, 
you have been upright. Not true. <laughs> and you're going and you're coming in with me and the army is good in my sight. For to this day, I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. It just feels so icky that mm. he's made such a good friend of Akish that Akish is like, I trust you like a brother. You're like family to me. You know, you have my back. You've never done anything wrong. Well, he hasn't been attacking straight up Philistines. He's been picking off He's been picking off um, peoples that are neither Philistine or Judean. But the relationship is built on a lie. Trickery. Yeah, Nothing yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. There's no... Uh, David in a second would attack the Philistines. I mean, they're oh, the yeah. Lord's enemies. Yeah, 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 David, yeah, yeah. David is not making friends here. He is simply uh, living a lie to hide from Saul. It makes you wonder how someone who's so emotionally transparent in his psalms is capable of this in his, you know... Um, leadership life. Ah, just it's interesting. Because we're all the hypocrites in the we end. We are. We, we really are. Okay. So I find it that it's so easy to see everybody else's hypocrisy. Fair. <laughs> Very fair. I can identify other people's uh, you know, weaknesses in a snap. I mean, it's so easy to see when other people mm -hmm. are at fault. But when people come to me and want to talk about my weaknesses, specifically my wife, who's an expert at my weaknesses. Isn't everyone's spouse an expert <laughs> at their weaknesses? So she comes to me and she tells me, and my immediate reaction is, she's wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that can't be true. That's not possible. I'm not like that. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. <sighs> That's the weakness of humanity. We can see problems in everybody else's life and not in our own. And David here cannot see past his own hand you know he cannot or see maybe what's he going sees on. it but he's all like the ends justify the means i'm just trying to survive here and provide for my 600 men and their families i'll back up and say once again that this whole plan is is in his own strength this is not him trusting in god Very this true. is i'm going to protect myself and here's the best plan that i can come up with to protect mm -hmm. me and I do not believe that God is in this plan. And we do those things. We get in mm -hmm. a mode and we decide, I'm going to do it in my own strength. And that's what David did. Yeah. So verse, uh, verse 7. Therefore return now, go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, but what have I done? And to the city, what have you found in me and your servant as long as I have been with you, that I cannot go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Man, David, why are you laying on the... I mean, you're buttering the bread now, seriously. Just let it go. Now he doesn't have to be in this conflict. Maybe he wanted to be there. He's putting on a show so that... So if he is too quick to go, okay, peace out, he either A, looks like a coward, or B, tips his hand that he probably really would, would stab them in the backs if he went into battle with them. He's buttering the bread, for sure. Yeah. But he is lying. So... Through let's, his let's be teeth. absolutely clear that David, and as we have seen in all the prophets, in all of the leaders that we've looked at, they all have uh, moments of weakness. And this mm -hmm. is one of David's moments of weaknesses. By the way, David has a bunch, but this mm -hmm. is one of them. Yeah. So verse 9, Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless... The princes and the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Now therefore rise early in the morning with your master's servants, whom have come with you, and as soon as you are up early in the morning, and have the light depart. So David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So David is dismissed. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to be in this battle, although I kind of think maybe he did want to be. He felt like the Lord was going to win this battle for Israel. That's his mindset, right? He doesn't think God's going to lose this battle. And he would have fought on the Lord's side. There's also, no doubt. Also, his bestie Jonathan's on the other side, and he really doesn't want to hurt Jonathan. Absolutely not. So he was definitely going to find a way to help God's people to win. Mm -hmm. Chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag 
on the third day that the Amalekites invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. So because the Amalekites know that the Philistines are marshalling for war and attacking somebody else, the Amalekites decide, let's do some raids into Philistine territory. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, by the way, very smart of them because you're going to find cities and the only thing in the cities are women and children. Yep. So easy uh, easy picking off of uh, small towns and things like that. Zik Ziklag technically is one of the smaller towns. Mm -hmm. Verse 2, they had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went on their way. Verse 3, so David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam and the, the, uh, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man and his son and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. All right, so things are not, things were going, I mean, even though he was being chased by Saul, mm -hmm. he never had a moment like this. Yeah. Uh, are, are you, you know, you're following the logic, right? Mm -hmm. He had some uh, moments where Saul was after him or was about to corner him, mm -hmm. but his family was never really at risk in any of these events. Mm -hmm. um, he was well defended, God protected him, but all of a sudden, he's not, you know, he's not being protected. Now, his wife, his wives are alive, the wives and children are alive. They don't find bodies in right. the city when they show back up. Yeah. But they've been taken. Yeah. Uh, how are you going to get them back? Right. Uh, how are you going to find them? Now you got to chase down the Amalekites and figure out mm -hmm. which way they went. And um, you're going to go fight an army in battle, but they have your women. They have your children and hostages. How is that all going to work out? It's very complicated and scary for them. Mm -hmm. And of course... Um... Almost as bad as finding bodies is just the horror of wondering, what are these people going to do to my family? Um, when I was away in Europe for the year, my, my parents probably worried more about me that year than any other year of my life because my reports home were infrequent and they wondered how many gaps there were and what sorts of dangers I was getting into. And understandably, because there was one point where I almost got hit by a train, another point where where I, en where I ended up having to ditch all my luggage. Here, you're Just, not helping you know, them to be at ease stuff. right now. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> they know about all this stuff now. Um, but, you know, even though that happened under, under circumstances where everyone knew what they were getting into, it was terrifying for mm -hmm. them. You know, mm -hmm. terrifying. It like, whenever terrifying. your girls moved out, I'm sure it was terrifying. It was terrifying. Um, Dropping and that's, them off that's at just, college, That's just the, the absolutely normal course of events. But when they're forcibly taken from you, and it includes not just, you know, young adults you hope have a, a, a better head on their shoulders, but your younger children, that... <sighs> that's a that's a different kind of terror. Something happens here at the end of this verse that we just read. Yeah. It says, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting moment because up to this point, he has, as I have already expressed, he has done this in his own strength. Mm -hmm. He has, uh, he's lying, he's living a lie. And, mm -hmm. um, and he's living with the enemies of God, which has to have him uncomfortable, you know, the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? And making a friend with Akish, someone who he should be driving out of the of the land, yet he's mm -hmm. making friends with him. All of this has to be um, just under his conscience. And David realizes that at this moment, when morale is at, a, at an all-time low, when maybe their families are lost, maybe his kingdom could be lost. I mean, how is he going to become king even if his best supporters are going to turn on him and want to stone him? Mm -hmm. David realizes, I need God. Need God. This is one of those important moments that all of us need to come to in our lives where mm -hmm. we say, I need God. More than I need yeah. plans, more than I need money, more than I need um, uh, 
counseling help, mm. more than I need um, a vacation, mm -hmm. more than I need a better job. I need God. Mm -hmm. And David is good at this. Yeah. David's good at recognizing these moments. He humbles himself and he goes and he takes quality time to repent and to find strength in God. Mm -hmm. He makes his soul right. He, yeah. he works through his stuff. Where How did I get mm -hmm. here? And works it through with God. In verse 7, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So now, for the first time in a while, David's like, I want direction from the Lord. Uh, you know how it's amazing we get off track? And we think we've got this in my own strength? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now he's, he's called the priest, called the ephod. He had it all along. Why didn't he ask God, hey, should we go to uh, the Philistines and live with them? Is this your will, Lord? No. But now he, he needs God. So he's going to go to God. So David inquired of the Lord in verse 8, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake him? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover everything all. So David went, he and his 600 men who were with him, they came to the brook of Bezor, and they stayed uh, the, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued he and his 400 men, for 200 stayed behind who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Bezor. Of course, they've been traveling. Three days morning. hard marching. Yes. Verse yeah. 11. So then they found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water. So this is interesting. As they're marching and crossing this troop of 400 men, they find an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. He's just lying in a field, lying on the ground, but he's hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, he's thirsty. Um, you know, he's weak. And they help him. Mm -hmm. They could have just stabbed him through with a sword. Uh, he's not of their people, right? They could mm -hmm. have just, uh, I mean, they, they, you know, they could have ignored him. They could have been like, mm -hmm. oh, man, a uh, homeless guy. Uh, you know, whatever, right? He looks really sick. He's going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. I wonder what disease he has. Let's not touch him. We might get sick. Um, they bring him to David, and David treats him like a guest mm -hmm. um, and feeds him and takes care of him. Verse 12, they gave him a piece of cake of figs, two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Which is a long time, no water. Yeah, you is. can go no bread. I mean, I've had zero food for 10 days, just water fasted. Mm -hmm. So you can survive. I mean, I was actually, I lost my hunger at about day four. You just stop being hungry. Mm -hmm. But um, but here's this guy who's had no water either. He's dehydrated. He's starving. And they're giving him a feast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they didn't have to give him figs and raisins. Uh, they're, they're treating him special. Verse 13. Well, and it's, it's smart, too, because that's some of the most concentrated quick energy in the mm -hmm. ancient world. It's, it's like our equivalent Sugar. of... Yeah. Carbohydrates. Yeah. 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 You know, a power bar. Then David said to him, To whom do you belong? Where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites. That's a strange one. I don't think I've said that very often. <laughs> In the territory which belongs to Judah and the southern area of Caleb, we found Ziklag. We burned Ziklag with fire. David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? So he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I'll take you down to this troop. There's a deal being made here. Yeah. And um, this Egyptian is open to David's help, which means if he's with the army, he's going to have food and protection. Mm -hmm. Being in the wild is not really safe. Uh, well, he was left for dead when he was lions, sick. bears. I mean, even the fact that he survived just laying in a field, not able to move through the night. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, pretty... It's cold. It's harsh. Uh-huh. And, you know, this also highlights something that we miss about slavery in Bible times. It was not based off of nationality. The Egyptians were an empire that had slaves. The Hebrews were once slaves of the Egyptians. Slavery happened one of several ways. Once is if you got into debt and couldn't pay it off, and, and so therefore you became a slave. But most likely this guy, by the fact that he's an Egyptian enslaved by an Amalekite, were just prisoners of war. 
Yep. Um, and in, we, they didn't have the Geneva Conventions back then. Mm-hmm. Um, if you got captured in battle, regardless of nationality, bam, you're their slave. Good luck. And slaves were in every possible nationality out there. Mm-hmm. Verse 16. And when he had brought them down, there they were, spread out over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not one man of them escaped except for 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. (laughs) So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil, or anything which they had taken from them, David recovered all. David took all the flocks and the herds that they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. So, a huge victory. David Mm -hmm. uses 400 and attacks an army larger than himself, Mm -hmm. and he has a great victory and the only ones who escape are 400 men who rode on camels because David couldn't... You can't run down a camel, basically. No, That's they're the so point. fast. Camels are fast. So, um... And they have the endurance like a tank to go through the desert for days, and it's just not worth, worth it not to chase to, them down. It's not worth it trying to run down a camel. Um, so... Uh, David, his victory is great. He gets all of his own money back, but he gets all the spoils that the Amalekites had raided the Philistine territories and, and, Judah. and Judah's territories. So David's really rich right now. Uh, uh, spoils of war mm-hmm. is uh, significant, but more important, he has his family back. Mm-hmm. This kind of remembers me, uh, reminds me of the story of Abraham and Lot when Lot mm-hmm. got captured. Yeah, and Abraham took uh, his servants. And uh, a couple of friends and uh, went and attacked and took the spoils of the five kings Mm -hmm. and uh, brought back the people of Sodom and his nephew. So it just has similar uh, similar vibe to it. And David now has the spoils. Verse 21. David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom also had made to stay at the brook of Bezor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And David came near to the people and he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. But David said, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered us into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to battle, so shall his part who stays by the supplies and shall share alike. Uh, It's interesting that it says worthless men that uh, went along with David. Uh, Basically, it's just saying that men's hearts full of selfishness. Mm -hmm. The thing is that they're obscenely wealthy right now. There were a lot of spoils. And... What, what are we talking about? There's 400 and 200, right? Mm-hmm. So you're talking about one-third yeah. of 600 people. So basically, everybody's going to have to give up one-third of mm-hmm. a fortune, uh, a, a wealth. I mean, cities bent, that have been raided, um, mm-hmm. s- spoils of war, a lot of money. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to get up a one-third. It's not going to be mm-hmm. a big deal. It's not like they're going to miss it or they're going to, I wish I was more rich. Uh, although well and the point of the mission was to recover their families getting rich was just an unexpected bonus the other side of this is that david makes the point that it's the spoils really belong to god not to them because god is the one who gave them Mm -hmm. the victory god is the one who said go you'll get your family back and you won't lose anything Mm -hmm. so in david's mind you know, how can you hang on to this when it was God who gave us the victory? He's the one that deserves the honor. Mm-hmm. Verse 25, so it was from that day forward that he made it a statue and an ordinance for Israel to this day. Basically, it means that those who stay with the supplies get the same amount of spoils as those who go to war. Now, this is this is wise because if you think about this in terms of strategic military terms, okay? Let's say that... God forbid you end up with a series of attacks and your men tire out at different rates. You can't realistically keep track of who's in and out of every skirmish if you end up with just serial attacks. 
And, um, you know, this is something that the passage brings up beautifully is that they're already tired out from the three day march. Well, you want some men resting up in case, God forbid, they get back with all the spoils and someone mm. else comes and attacks them. Yeah. Because the folks who just returned from battle will not be ready to attack again. Um, the same problem that just happened. When they went off to war, they took all the men, left nobody behind to protect the women, and so they lost them. So mm -hmm. uh, David's learned his lesson. He's saying, we're going to leave some people behind. They're already mm -hmm. tired anyway. This is a good fix. You know, this is this is also makes a case for, in our church ministries, doing volunteer rotation. Mm. Volunteer rotation um, is something that's not necessarily a popular idea, but it's important because if the same people do everything all the time, even if they're really good at it, they will get burnt out. Mm. And they won't have the energy needed to keep doing it long term, and then no one else will be trained to do whatever it is. So I believe in teams, you know? Mm -hmm. I believe in teams that, that tap in, tap out, um, that there is, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors and that it's good to have redundancies. We think of redundancies as just being extra wasteful. Sure. But it's good to have redundancies in leadership so that if, God forbid, something happens to the, that core set of volunteers, they can go back and, you know, mind the home fires knowing that that ministry will still be taken care of. Verse 26. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To those who were in Bethel, to those who were in Ramah, to the south, those who were in Jatir, those who were in Aror, those who were in Sifmoth, those who were in Eshtelmia, Oa, Eshtemoa. Oma, Eshtemoa, thank you. Those who were in Rachel, those who were in the cities of the Jeremielites, that's an interesting one, one I haven't said that often. <laughs> those who were in the cities of the Kenites, those who were in Horma, those who were in Koroshan, those who were in Athach, and those who were in Hebron, to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to rove. This is interesting. So he has the spoils of cities in Judah that have been mm -hmm. raided, and he sends the spoils into Judah, not directly to the cities that were destroyed per se, mm -hmm. but he uses the money to support all the cities. Yeah. He doesn't put himself first. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just keep the money for himself. He uses mm -hmm. it to benefit all these cities, which he's buying, um, he's buying relationships. Mm. Uh, by sending this money to them, they're going to be his staunch supporters in mm -hmm. the future. These are the cities later on that are going to have his back mm -hmm. when he's being attacked because they saw that when he didn't have to, he took some of the spoils that he deserved that were for himself and used it to help others, to lift up everybody. Yeah. And uh, he was already showing himself as the kind of leader that didn't put himself first. Unlike those in his troop that tried to save everything, every part for their own, you mm -hmm. know, benefit, David shows, no, I'm not going to keep this for myself. I'm going to share this mm -hmm. with the people. This is going to benefit everybody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, overlooking this uh, couple of passages, I see David go through a change. Mm -hmm. um, he had a scare. Uh, he reconnects himself with God. And then he's back on track to who he normally is. He's God's mm -hmm. uh, sword. He is God's righteous fighter. Mm -hmm. um, he is a leader. He's uh, giving to others. He's not self-focused right now. He's not worried mm -hmm. about himself. Um, David is back on track. And I guess for me, thinking about that lesson, I think, you know, if you find yourself off track, mm -hmm. which happens to us all, I get off track. Oh, truly. If you find yourself off track... Um, it's a great moment to connect with God, mm -hmm. to reevaluate your life, to see where you went wrong, to repent, mm -hmm. to confess your sins, to talk to a counselor, to uh, talk to a pastor, talk to a friend, a spiritual friend who will give you uh, encouragement. Will lift Something you up. that helps me in these moments is journaling my prayers. Mm. I, I just 
I can't focus if I just think them. Writing them out helps me focus and go, okay, God, here's what it is. Ah, and it helps me focus. <laughs> the expression is strengthen yourself in the Lord. Yes, and whatever that yes. is for you, that is the perfect moment to do it. Mm -hmm. And we can see in David's life that as soon as he strengthened himself in the Lord, he was mm -hmm. right back on track to being the David that we knew versus the David that was hiding among mm -hmm. the Philistines and lying and, you know, f faking who he was and all of right. this. So, um, you know, let, let the Lord uh, lead you as you see that, you know what, mm -hmm. I need to... Uh, I need to reconnect. I need to strengthen myself yeah. with God. There's an opportunity there. Take it. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll be to your benefit. Let's mm -hmm. pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Always poignant lessons for us. I just pray, Heavenly Father, that as we are internalizing our own um, need of you, I just pray, Father, that you would encourage everyone who's listening to take the time to strengthen themselves in the Lord, to reconnect with you, to repent of their sins, and to take, take the time, Father, to make sure that their hearts are right with you. All of our, our hearts are right with you. Thank mm -hmm. you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.